Happy Sunday. It is Sunday. It's Collider Mailbag, and we are here for you guys answering your questions on a laid back show. Just seeing what you want to talk about. Just a couple casual peeps talking about casual questions on a casual Sunday. Yep. Market it. <laughs> let's sell it. Whatever. Joining me, as always, it is Dennis Zhang. What's up, man? Doing good. It's only a few more weeks till Game of Thrones premieres. Oh, it's Sunday. Th true. That's gonna be my occupy all my Sunday nights. I'm not gonna be able to hear from you. Don't. I'm, I'm yeah. not working. Leave me alone. Yeah. Well, I'm probably gonna have to shoot reviews for those that's as well. True. That's true. But at least I get to watch the episode beforehand. And joining us here is Natasha Martinez. Yes. Hello. Now I have the Game of Thrones song stuck in my head. Just so you watch it. You watch Game of Thrones. I actually don't watch <gasps> it. Why? For, because is it too R-rated for you? It's a bit too much uh, for me. Right. But I know that I would love it uh -huh. because I love Lord of the Rings and I love dragons. Oh, and it's, all it's, that. So it's Lord of the it's Rings different. on cocaine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot <laughs> yeah. different than Lord of the Rings. Maybe yeah. I'll get around to it, but uh, as of now, no. <laughs> all right. Well, you should check it out. It's a great show. But hey, this is what we're here for too. Let's talk about some stuff. What do we got? Okay, Gary Richardson writes, Hey guys, so I was watching Movie Talk and listening to you all discussing movie soundtracks. Now Hans Zimmer has decided to reti retire from superhero movies. You all stated you preferred soundtracks such as Danny Elfman's from the Keaton era Batman, for example, which I agree 100% with. But... From the studio's point of view, do you think they go for big known bands and songs to fill out their films purely for the dollar aspect? Well, they make more money from sales of soundtracks if that CD or download was a dozen well-known songs from famous groups and singers rather than original scores. Um, no, not really. It depends. It really depends on the film because if there is a film like you know like batman v superman or something that it's just a bunch of rock songs and and whatever or pop songs it doesn't fit you got to have a score i mean it'll be in there for like i thought in man of steel that was used well was that sound garden song that they use it's it's when it's set well and when you can smell when they're just trying to put mo songs in there to just put like oh this is a cool soundtrack just to kind of you guys should buy it on for 13.99 uh but this, I, I think that when it comes to certain genre films, you're going to see scores more because I think that scores actually get bought up quite a lot. Like you're never going to see, uh, you know, Adam uh, Levine or whatever his name is. Who, who's the Ed from? Is that the. Yeah, from Maroon 5. You're never going to see him singing a Star Wars song. <laughs> and for, it's always. There'll be a riot. It'll be a riot. So there, and so there, there, there's times when they can use it. Now, however, when they do a movie like Valentine's Day. Yeah. There's no need for a score. They probably have a score in there, but you're not. You're going to be paying attention more to the songs and the soundtracks that fit that scene. And sometimes you look at someone like um, like Richard Linklater, by the way, who just did um, Everybody Wants Some. That is a movie that needs a soundtrack because it's the '80s. It's representative to the film. Quentin Tarantino, is someone else who uses who uses songs to tell the stories of the film. I think that you can sell a soundtrack. For me personally. I actually prefer scores, um, and I know I know that you were kind of saying like, but just so you know, and not just sound like, well, actually, but Danny Elfman's was a score, not a soundtrack. Um, although the Batman, the Batman soundtrack, however, with Prince and everything, was the soundtrack. There was two. There was a score yeah. and a soundtrack. Um, so it just depends. What do you think? Yeah, I also think that the studios aren't super concerned with it. I mean, it's sometimes when it fits, when you're talking about something like like a YA movie or something like that, where it's like, okay this certain audience will buy these songs if we put them in there. But if you're talking about, you know, genre films or the big ten book, like imagine if like, I don't know, Mission Impossible had a bunch of pop songs in it, right. you know, it's going to take people out of it. And they're not concerned about making that. I mean, I made this uh, on another, I don't know if it was on a mailbag during, um, during the week or, or during uh, one of our weekend shows, but you know, about YouTube trailers making money for, for uh, the studios, it's like they're not concerned with that aspect. Right. They're concerned about selling movie tickets. They want to sell movie tickets and merchandising. That's what they want. And, 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 and soundtracks are part of that, but it's just, I don't feel like it's a big enough number for them to like extremely like, let's turn the movie this way so we can fit, fit that. But that's why I said it depends on the film because yeah. there are some movies that they have yes. to do that for. There are certain movies that they don't and there are certain movies that the director is going to go, don't even talk to me about that because yeah. it doesn't fit my movie. But then there are other directors that say, I want this song to be in there because it fits the scene. So it really is case by case um, on each movie. But it, it's also changed dramatically from like 10, 15 years ago with the 
with from YouTube and everything like because we, music videos used to be a big thing as far as for the for the vid, for the movies like there would be stuff like I remember wanting to watch movies just see if there was clips of <laughs> yeah. the movie inside of the video there was this big thing I remember even like the the Beverly Hills Cop dan, 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 dan. like that was a video and it had <laughs> clips of Axl Rose putting a banana in the tailpipe and all that stuff so it it just changed dramatically with with the age of YouTube and everything too but I think that it's it really is I think that in a good way it's become more reliant on vision than it is just selling the soundtrack. Yeah, imagine telling crystal hey we want that one emo core band right you know blah 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 to sing your lead song <laughs> we blah, got blah, blah, yeah. my favorite yeah. it's pretty band. good it's yeah. pretty good we got imagine what chris nolan would say to that to the studio or whoever right. else he'd call he'd be calling up universal and start <laughs> making movies movies there um isn't he did, wait actually didn't he do universe wasn't I know he had a deal with Warner Brothers for a while, yeah. but did he do? Who did Interstellar? Was Interstellar was that through might Paramount have, or Universal? I, want, uh, it, I think it might have been Paramount. Yeah, it was because it wasn't Warner Brothers at that time around. I don't think. Um, what the hell do I know? All right, what's next? <laughs> Alex Rahal writes, "What up, Collider Crew? Yo, yo! With the possible emergence of video game movies, depending on the success of Warcraft and Assassin's Creed, what do you guys think of a Mass Effect movie? In my opinion, this game has to be one of the best sci-fi storylines ever. I even rank it higher than Halo. Thanks for the daily entertainment. Um, I am going to talk to the." Mass Effect fan yeah. on the table. Uh, Dennis, will this be a movie? Should it be a movie? I, uh, yes, and yes. I think eventually it will be a movie. It is, I agree with you, one of the best sci-fi storylines. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I don't know if you played the game, but you know that Bioware <coughs> are the same people that made Knights of the Old yeah, Republic. Drew Carpetian was in the main writer. Yeah, yeah, so they created Mass Effect based on their experience with Knights of the Old Republic. Mm -hmm. and, and it follows a lot of similar, you know, the way that they formed the team and Commander Shepard's the main guy. So I think they eventually will. I think uh, it's a story that's just too good to pass up, plus uh, with a fan base. And I, uh, I think we're going to see a Halo one as well. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I know that, that that's kind of how I know a lot about Mass Effect mm -hmm. is because I was such a Knights of the Republic fan and because I had the pleasure of speaking to, um, to Drew Carpetian, who was one of the main writers of um, that movie. And from what I hear from fans yeah. is how much this should be made into a film of a, this is this just ripe for storytelling in a feature film or maybe even for a Netflix series. I don't know, but I would say probably more towards a towards a movie um, from what I've heard. But I can't speak enough about it because I've never played. Well, the game. I think financially, I don't know if they could afford to make mm, okay. a movie or not a movie, a TV series for it because right. it does it covers you know a whole universe and it's it, it they they basically try to make their own universe with different planets and different. Uh, creatures and different alien, you know, and right. so think of so, something like Star Wars. That's why Star Wars live action TV series has been so hard to get off the ground <laughs> because kidding. of money. Right. You know, it's not that they don't want to do it. It's money. So right. I yeah. think that's this is going to be a movie, I think. All right. What's next? Manu writes, hey, I saw The Sixth Sense again after a long time. Man, was that movie great. Despite all the parodies for it, it's a damn good movie. Unbreakable and Signs were outstanding movies, too. We all know what happened after that. Do you guys think M. Night will ever return to form? I certainly think it's possible because even though I didn't love The Visit, um, there was a little bit more to his filmmaking in that movie and the the my biggest thing that with him w for a while was it the, his movie started to get a little pretentious this movie the visit even though, again i didn't love it it didn't feel pretentious it felt like legitimate like he was having fun and that he was making a movie that you know he totally believed in he saw some there were some legitimate scares in it it was creepy at times um a little ridiculous for me but like ellis loved it um, Copster on our on the Schmoes team loved it, so there were certainly people who liked that movie as opposed to the Airbender, which you should That's line your toilets with. Yeah, it's, it is a disaster. Oh, we got to do a commentary on that. Oh, that why, I mean, yes and no. Uh, yes, oh. yes, in the fact that it would be, it's going to be it's hysterical. Be but my God, to have to sit through that movie again. Like my my buddy who reviewed that film with us said that he was he went to see the movie with us looked next to him and saw the person sleeping and he was jealous um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I was like uh, it was yeah it, it, it was one of those it's one of those movies but the question on the table is can Shyamalan get back to form and I think the answer is yes I really do think that it is and, and we all we all love a comeback story mm -hmm. and the fact that he had and I've, I've we've got to speak to him at Comic-Con this year genuinely nice guy 
a really nice guy, which I was surprised at because I didn't know from I've seen him in interviews and been a little standoffish and stuff, too. But I got to sit down with him and talk to him and nice guy and I'm, I kind of found myself rooting for him as opposed to back in the day when with the question mark overhead and that smug look like the next Spielberg take it easy guy <laughs> let's 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 go let's get your career going before you start promoting yourself that way but um, I hope that he does I, I'm rooting for him what do you think so as someone who's probably one of the most outspoken critics yeah. of him online I actually in, in a weird way also want to see him come back to form um i don't know he's never going to reach that level where he was at with the sixth sense and you know the next spielberg question mark and all that stuff right but maybe he can come back and be a solid director i mean that's a, that's a step up from the stuff that he was churning out before i mean that i mean those three movies in a row uh Lady in the Water, right? Uh, the Happening, Oof. and Last Airbender. I've never seen a run like that before. Oof. Like those are three colossal, yeah. like just Turds. crap. Yeah, Turds. crap fest. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, you know, I, I want to see the. I haven't seen the visit yet, and I kind of want to watch it just to see if there are things in it that I see. Oh, you know what? Look, he did a good job with that. Maybe it's not the whole movie, but that scene right there, the way he constructed that or the way he put this together and like those flashes of what he had before. So I'm actually looking, you know, maybe I'll go watch that sometime soon. Watch it because I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think. I, I don't necessarily think you're going to love it yeah. and say this great movie, but I, I, I feel like you would say there's something in there. Yeah. There's something in there because I certainly felt that way too and it was definitely his best movie in a long time. But again, going over that resume of... of Fart pillows. It's 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 something that I don't I don't know is that much of a compliment. All right, what's next? Matthew Yamasaki writes, "Hey Collider, I would like to know what has been up with the Rock and his role within the DCU. I know he was confirmed for a role within the with within a future film, but since that announcement, nothing. Thanks for taking my question and keep up the great work." Um. Yeah. So this is something that's been around for a long time. I still had no idea why he announced he was going to be Black Adam when the movie comes out in like what 2020 or something something ridiculous it's like what like I don't it's it, I, it's not going to happen I don't think he's going to play I do think he's going to wind up playing Lobo though uh, that'd I think, be awesome I think that they talked that, that, that there's been more talk about that, that movie's going to happen I think that's what is going to happen in his role with the DC Universe he's going to wind up playing Lobo for a long time it was rumored that he was going to play that character and I think that is what's going to happen I think that he will eventually pop up in one of these universes I don't think it's going to be Marvel anymore he's been rumored in the DC Universe for a very long time obviously with Black Adam and but I don't do not be surprised if there is an announcement that he's not being play, playing Black Adam anymore and he goes and he's playing Lobo well, I like your scenario a lot yeah. more than what's currently. I mean, with Black Adam, he's known amongst the hardcore comic book fans, but not a lot of people. I mean, even Shazam, right. he's a little more well-known, but Black Adam isn't as. And I feel like it's almost like a waste of The yeah. Rock, you know? I, I feel like with his charisma and everything and, and his star power that he should be playing someone like a Lobo. Yeah. And he would he would fit. I, I mean, I've mentioned Jason Momoa would be a, a good Lobo, but he obviously is Aquaman. Yep. So The Rock would be great as that. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, the fact that the movie is so far out and with all the stuff that's going on with DC right now, I just feel like it, it's better if they just go that route. It was so strange to announce a movie. Like, so uh, some, like I mean, they don't even know. Han Solo movies come out in two years. We still don't know who the person is, but a movie that's coming out in like 2020 or announced, it's, it was a weird, weird decision. Maybe this because they wanted to announce that Rock's part of the DCU. Yeah, I think they wanted to lock him down and say, yeah. like, they didn't want Marvel to get him. So like, look, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll pay you and you do this or whether the movie happens or not, we'll right. give you some money. Right. All right, what's next? Majid writes, Dear Collider, a question that has been disturbing me ever since the BBS Rotten Tomato score. I know the movie is okay and such. However, after checking the names of most of critics, I realized that I don't know most of their background in relation to movie production. I know, for example, John Schnepp is a director and huge comic book enthusiast. Thus, his point in any movies, especially superhero genre, takes into account. My complex question is, what qualifies a person to be a movie critic? Since recently, we're having a lot of these in Rotten Tomato and YouTube. Uh, great question. Now, look, here's here's a, a scenario for you. Myself, I am a certified critic on Rotten Tomatoes, and my experience was that I worked in, I talked about this yesterday too, I worked in development and in production for uh, Silver Pictures for about three or four years. has nothing to do with me being a critic, though. It has, it, my, my knowledge as far as like certain things that I see and know how things go into it, but I still, I like to 
watch movies as a fan the same way I did as a kid. I like to watch it. You, you got to be from when you're doing this. You you, you do are obviously develop a little bit more of a critical eye. But I don't do the and this is not taken away from anybody that does. But I don't do the film school thing where I just like well it wasn't shot this particular way or do this. It's just it's not something that I that I've never done i've always wanted to approach it kind of how why we started schmoes was to approach it in a way that the average film you know, just the average person would go and talk to their friends about it. and that's i think has changed not just us but obviously from guys like uh, chris stuckman and jeremy johns and and dudes that, that have done that in the youtube space of what you're referring to um that is also the approach that they take of the the average fan who, who watches movies and they we've Chris Stuckman also certified Rotten Tomatoes to me. So the landscape has changed with Rotten Tomatoes, and that's just in the YouTube um, space. But then when you go and you look at other people that you might not know, a lot of them, a lot of guys are film school guys. A lot of people are are bloggers. A lot. I mean, there's the landscape has just changed dramatically over the. It's not just it was just print reviewers for a very long time who were who were film students or film fans. It's not everybody is in production. So. A lot of these people that you might not have recognized are just people who were started out maybe as avid film fans, were great writers, submitted their, this is for the print guys, submitted their pieces to either, whether it be websites or or papers or whatever it might be, and that's how they got the gig because they wrote about film in the particular way that that site or that paper talks to their audiences, and that's the way that particular, they like that critic's voice. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not as cool as Christian over there. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> nope. a certified Rotten Tomato critic. However, I feel like my opinion is an informed opinion. Mm -hmm. I did go to film school. I studied film history. I studied like kind of the structure of writing. I've worked in development. I've worked in post-production. I've worked in production. So I feel like I have a nice base to analyze films. Sure. And I don't sit there and go, oh, man, I have to analyze every little thing or whatever. And I can't enjoy it. I enjoy it plenty of popcorn flicks mm -hmm. like if you watch and see the movies that i like they they can range from more of an indie drama to like whatever like something like pacific rim or or right. whatever force right. awakens anything like that so i don't have any type of particular uh type of movie that i like i just like good movies that's it yeah good movies and then i i look at them and i see why did i like that movie and i, I like look at like okay is it the writing is it the dialogue is it the cinematography it's the editing the one thing is it's it's you know it's not just one thing it's like all these different things combined and i think that's where i come from um, all right, what's next? Mike Sandoval writes, I was recently watching one of my favorite movies, License to Drive, with Corey Feldman and the late Corey Haim. Combined, they've done some fantastic movies. Do you guys have any favorite Corey movies, whether it be with one of them or both? Thanks for taking my question. You all are awesome. Um, I have to go to Lost Boys. Mm -hmm. Lost Boys, I think, is absolutely my favorite Corey movie, the Corys. Um, if you're going to go single Corey Feldman, you got to go either Goonies or even Gremlins, mm -hmm. by the way, which a lot of people don't know he's in, but but Goonies. Um, but the two of them, License to Drive is a good one as well, too. But for me, I'm taking Lost Boys. I remember that movie was just, um, it was a lot of campy fun. Uh, I am definitely going to go with Corey Feldman and Goonies because I yeah. just love that movie. It's just like a, it's like an adventure for kids. Mm -hmm. um, and then Corey Haim, Lucas. Yeah. Lucas is a, which actually isn't the, the female lead in from Goonies She's as in well. Goonies, yeah. So, so Andy. Yeah. So yeah. Corey Feldman worked with her in Goonies and Corey Haim worked with her in Lucas. Trivia question for you, Modest Assassin. <laughs> Who plays the jock in Lucas? Oh, man. I know it, too. Put him too. on the spot. Put him on I the spot. I know it, too. Come on, Zeng Master. Oh. Do you know? No. <laughs> oh. oh, Charlie Sheen. Yes. yes. Point, Zeng. Where's, where, point. where's my point? Point. You got a point. <laughs> well done. Well done. Um, okay, what's next? Okay, Brian Cash writes, do the video sales go towards the total gross of a movie, and does The Force Awakens have a chance of making a billion domestically? It's a fantastic question, but I think the answer is no. No. I think it goes to home video sales yeah. is what it goes to. So, no, it does not go there because there are a lot of movies that would look like they were a bigger success than they were financially because movie, there are a lot of movies that have done way better on Blu-ray and you know digital download than they did in the theater. Um, so, no, they do, not go, they, they do not go there. And as far as your billion-dollar question goes domestically, what are we at right now with them? Do you know? Oh, I forgot. It's 900 something. I can't remember. I will look that up when Dennis answers the question. Uh, yeah, it doesn't go to it. Uh, but 
definitely studios look at those sales numbers because uh, I don't know if you remember Austin Powers, the first movie actually didn't do very well at, really? the, at the theater. It would, I think it did okay, but it became such a cult hit on VHS. And this is like VHS right. days, not the, even DVDs, VHS that they sold so many and people were quoting that movie all the time. Once it came out and people were renting it, that they decided to make a second one. So it definitely can impact whether or not a, a second movie gets yeah. made. Uh, the force awakens as of today, $934 million domestic. I don't see it during this run, no. uh, making a billion. However, if there's some kind of re-release, and if they'll probably re-release it a few different times, even if it's in ten years from now, um, also because they like they did, because you remember when they re-released the special editions of Star Wars in '97, that did go to the box office yeah. because that's a theatrical release. So I think that because they're going to want to get to that billion dollars, you throughout the years you're going to see them keep releasing it into the theater. Well, they're going to have to. They're going to re-release it before uh, Episode Eight. I feel. You like think we, so? Like, yeah, like, like a, a weekend, thing. like a weekend yeah. type of thing. Like let's do one week before yeah. this weekend. Watch Force Awakens again one time. You know how many people are going to go? You're going to go probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. What's next? David Christopher Bowling writes. Hollywood writers are what make a movie sound great with their dialogue, but can lose their steam after getting respect. For example, Randall Wallace wrote Braveheart and later on did the writing for Pearl Harbor, which its script was terrible. How come a writer can write a really good movie and then something bad later on in the future? Well, I'm going to answer this particular question with the examples that you gave. The answer is Mel Gibson directing, Michael Bay directing. Um, that for this particular example, now that's not that's not always the case. But as far as Braveheart, which a guy who had a clear vision of what he wanted the William Wallace saga to look like, one of my favorite, if not, it's definitely in my top ten of all time, Braveheart. Um, and then you have Michael Bay, who cut an amazing trailer for Pearl Harbor, but made it a Nicholas Sparks film. The movie's a Nicholas Sparks film. If well, you look, so, at it. yeah. Well, I mean, he he was trying to do Titanic. He was. Like he, was he was like, oh, okay, I got Ben Affleck, yep. I got Josh Hartnett, and I got, uh, what's her name? Um, the uh, Underworld Liz Girl. Right. Uh, Elizabeth, not Elizabeth Hurley. Uh, what's, her, what's her face? Kate Beckinsale. Yeah. So Kate Beckinsale, um, the three of those, and you look at the casting, but you look at the way that if you just put that script, because it's Michael Bay telling Randall Wallace, okay, listen, I want you to do this, this, and this. Like you said, make me my Titanic. And say, all right, well, here's, here's kind of the story I had. But in the script... You read of all this stuff going down, and, and and then a guy running to save his girlfriend. Oh, this could be kind of interesting. Just like because we and you put the two, both Braveheart and Pearl Harbor, and like an action scene. You like, oh, maybe this got that same kind of emotion. But the particular directing, I think, for that movie, uh, that's that's why that happened. But it's also to say that Randall Wallace didn't have a lot of hits after that. But maybe it was because of again the division of the the vision of the director. Now there are a lot of there are a lot of writers out there that continue like just hit after hit after hit that they're able to do it but it's just it, it you, it's luck of the draw man it's luck of the draw of who you who you team up with what the producers want to do with your movie what the because you're you're the script that you always that you write from the beginning even though you get credit for it isn't necessarily the script that shows up yeah. on screen like there can be a lot of things that they improvise that even though like there's a particular this, this could be good or bad for a writer you have I don't know what Jonah Hill and uh, and and uh, what's and Seth Rogen in a particular scene, right? Guys who are improv all the time, and some guy who's a brand new screenwriter wrote wrote the initial script, and they improv this scene, and it's just hysterical. Everybody's cracking up, even though they'll fi find out a pressure on. Could you guys improv that at all too? Oh yeah, a little bit. Blah, blah, blah. For the most part, that writer will get the credit for making a really hysterical scene. Flip side of that is that people go off your script and start doing a whole bunch of other things, and it's terrible. You get blamed. So it's it's it, you know it's it's luck of the draw in this crazy business. Yeah, I'm gonna take it from a different perspective. As I'm thinking, like with a writer in any creative position, like a director, we talked about M Night Shyamalan. You have the capacity to to make good things and terrible things, and it all depends on different stuff. Like whether you're passionate about the project. Maybe it's a you know you're being hired to write something you don't care about. Like. You know, something like the Pez movie. Some right, if right. you're like a magnificent writer and they throw a buttload of money at you and you go, you know what? I need that money. And you're right. like, I'm gonna write whatever. You don't care about it, and maybe it's crap. Yeah. But you got that money. So it's there's all a lot of different factors, and it's with every creative position, director, even actors, you know? They yep. they sometimes they put in a good performance, sometimes they don't. So I think I think it's the nature of the business. That's why it's like 
look, someone like a Tom Cruise, right? As many of us ridicule like any kind of crazy stuff that he does, he always brings it. Yeah. He always brings it. Even in movies that aren't that great, he puts on the best performance possible that he can. Yeah. And so like not everyone does that, you know? And yeah. it, it's tough. Yeah, it's true. Okay, I think that's it. Yes? Yep. Yes. That is our episode of Collider Mailbag. Thank you for joining us on, in on this very special Sunday. I would like to thank the people joining me today. First, Dennis, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And don't forget to watch a TV talk tomorrow. Natasha Martinez, where can they find you? You guys can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Natasha Lexis underscore. And before I let you go, I also want to let you know that the movie Schmodown, the movie trivia Schmodown, episode two, Mance versus Roca, it's up on the channel right now. If you didn't see it, go and watch it right after this show. Dennis, without any spoilers, yes. what did you think of the match? It, it lives up. If you guys watched the promo that we, we put out last week, it lives up to the promo. Yeah. Like sometimes it doesn't, like you get the hype. And then it's just a letdown. But this, this, delivered. this delivered. It really, really delivered. I don't think this is the last we'll see of these two. So please go and check that out. Leave your comments. Share it. Tell people about it. The first episode we did has over 80,000 views. Thank you so much for that. And let's get Manson Roca up there, too. So go and check that out. And then join us again here on Mailbag next week. You can find me, Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. Find me on Collider Jedi Council every Thursday. And we'll see you all this week on Movie Talk on TV Talk, Heroes, Jedi Council. We got a lot going on. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.